This evening, we have two guest speakers who've come from the same congregation, and that is uh, for a reason. Because um, they represent, I think, opportunities. And they're going to present that opportunity from two different perspectives, I think. Tonight, we'll see what they're going to do. Well, they're very unpredictable, actually, so we'll see what will happen. Reverend Carolyn Steves uh, is the campus pastor, uh, the Brentwood campus pastor at the Journey Church. Well, she has been. Um, she is on her way to be the lead pastor of West End Baptist Church in St. John's, Newfoundland. <laughs> Carolyn grew up in, I was going to say St. John, but I live on the west side. So Carolyn grew up in West St. John. Went to Lancaster Baptist Church where she met Christ at the age of 12 under the ministry of Nelson Metcalf, who I saw was here tonight. And I think that's just really neat that he has come to be here tonight. In 1992, uh, she began attending Allison Baptist Church on the Salisbury Road in Moncton. Uh, she served in a number of capacities as a volunteer became part of the staff in uh, the year 2000, and it looks to me like still served in a variety of roles after that time. In 2008, she became past a campus pastor of the Brentwood campus of the Journey Church, the new name of the church. She is a graduate of Acadia Divinity College. She and her husband, David, uh, have been married for 30 years, just about, and they have three children. Reverend David Morehouse, he was born in Moncton, actually. Uh, parents, did you say lived right on the Salisbury Road? That's amazing. Uh, he grew up in Fredericton, though. Went to Atlantic Baptist College, uh, St. Thomas University, uh, Regent College. And in addition to graduating from those places, graduated from the Aero Leadership Program. Since 1986, he has been the pastor of what was at first Allison Baptist Church and now the Journey Church. He's been a columnist uh, with the Moncton Times and Transcript for 23 years. Uh, he has served on the board of World Vision. He has been the chair of the board at Crandall University. He's served in our convention in a number of capacities. Uh, he and his wife Nancy have uh, four young adult children. I don't think I need to say too much more in terms of what you're going to talk about because you're going to talk about it. So why don't you come up and I'll pray for you and you can share with us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this week, a time to come away from whatever other responsibilities we have and think anew about the life that is ours in Jesus Christ. And to think about the way in which that life transforms people, transforms congregations, transforms communities. As the gospel is proclaimed, as your Holy Spirit works in us to your glory. We thank you for those who have shared with us. And tonight we thank you so much for Carolyn and for Dave. We thank you for the ministry to which you have called them. For the experiences that they have had that they can share with us. Thank you for the blessing that they and their church have been to us. And I pray that tonight you would guide them in what they have to say. That as they share with us, we might listen and allow you to use their words. To teach us, to give us fresh ideas and insights that would be helpful in, helpful in each of our contexts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to say thank you to Stephen. Uh, I've known Steve for too far along. I, feel, I seem to be getting a lot of feedback. Whoa. Hello? Okay. I apologize to those who have to listen to all that. Um, so tonight what we want to do is simply just tell our story 
around us becoming a multi-site church and going through what we felt were some paradigm shifts as we sought to try to understand what it means to be a missional church in the early part of the 21st century. I, I think that at the end of the day, I, I'm going to leave all the, the more sophisticated academic analysis to people like Dr. McMullen and other uh, luminaries even here gathered tonight to sort of sort it out and put it in the right categories, uh, sociologically, you know, theologically, all those categories that we do need to process. But I do believe that, um, I, I hope that tonight it's an encouragement because in the time I've been here since yesterday, just hearing other people's stories, I'm reminded again that God's at work. Uh, there's lots of stories. And out of those stories, um, I think we can share a common narrative about saying, okay, so what's God doing? So I really hope that, that our first goal is as we share our story, and we're hopefully going to be transparent enough and honest enough that it will um, not only encourage you, but hopefully um, educate you to say, okay, maybe, maybe there's something there I heard that maybe I need to explore in my own context and take our story and, and apply it in your own context and filter away. So I'm, that was my brief little introduction. I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn now. Um, and we also want to ooh, turn on your mic. There we go. Hi. We also want to acknowledge those of you who are watching online through the live streaming. We're so glad to be here. Um, as part of this story, you know, Dave and I played different roles, very different roles. Um, Dave played the role of the visionary who inspired a share of vision amongst a leadership team that I was privileged to be part of at the time. And I became the leader that had to live out this um, vision of this story. I had to be the one who implemented this along with others amongst our leadership team. And that was sort of the role that I played. I mean, it was such an exciting time. So just to let you know what you're in for, we have a seven chapter story. It's short chapters. Yes, absolutely. Don't leave. Uh, we have seven chapters to this story. And along the way, we want to encourage you that if you're on Twitter, you can go ahead um, to the Twitter account called at Acadia Div. If you have a question, we're going to kind of pause in between chapters and uh, you can use the hashtag Simpson15 and uh, we'll answer questions as we go along. But of course, at the end, there'll be a chance for people to to do uh, some questioning along the way. So we'll do a shout out to you who are watching um, live stream as well. I want to say hi to Kevin Vincent. Hi, Kevin. Um, we miss you, but we're, you know, we were glad to see you this week. So chapter one is entitled The Catalyst. How did things start us down this road where we went from being a single site uh, church and we, over the years from 86, we had been experiencing um, some measure of success in ministry as we were reaching out within Greater Moncton. Uh, we were reaching people uh, with our approach and uh, we, came, we came to a bit of a crisis about 10 years ago because a couple things. One, we, our, our facility, which we had built back in 1994, uh, was now starting to really feel the stress, even though it was only about uh, 11 years old. And we were wondering, well, what do we do next? And at that time, you got to understand that we live in Moncton, and for those of you who understand the context of greater, uh, I mean, Atlantic Canada, within the evangelical world, of course, the largest evangelical church is in Moncton, and that's the Westland Church. And of course, we live in the shadow of that, of that church, not in a bad way. I've known Dr. Laurel Buckingham, of course, he retired just a few years ago, but I've enjoyed a, a relationship with him in that church. But the question was, um, you know, where do we go from here? And, 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 and again, I want to say this, and it's a very contextual statement, but there was this feeling of, um, at that time, you know, we were between four and 500, and, you know, on weekend attendance, we were thinking, well, you know, are we ready to go to the next step? And it was all about, well, do we build bigger? Because that seemed to be the formula as far as managing outreach and growth in a church. Just build bigger, that, that's the formula. 
And, and I was sort of getting my head around that. And anyway, we invited an architect actually from the Southern Baptist Convention who specialized in you know, making recommendations and consulting with churches. And, and I can remember two things happened that sort of made me pause. Number one, I remember he came up to visit us and do a consultation with the leadership. And he sort of said, well, what are you dreaming? And we said, well, you know, we were playing the movie. We'd like to have maybe an auditorium of six that would sit between 600 and 800. And, you know, we were, you know, a nice big stage, you know, for theatrical productions and all this sort of talk. And so he started to do the square footage for us and figure things out. And, and he said, well, if you're going to have also the supporting building environment around this, he said, you need to budget $5 million. Oh, <laughs> five million dollars and uh, I went wow and uh, I went wow five million dollars anyway while there were people in our leadership say you got to have faith Dave you just we got to do it we're going to be the Baptist Wesleyan Church in Moncton so uh, let's do it we're going to catch those Wesleyans you know sort of thing <laughs> and uh, I was like whoa five million dollars well then I, as I was wrestling with that um, I, another disruptive thing came into my life uh, Dr. Andy Barnes uh, was a professor at the time at Lang Baptist University and uh, which is now Crandall obviously and he was attending our church along with he and his wife and family, and he said, Dave, you need to go to the developing world. As, I mean, at that stage of life, I'd been so busy just working my local church, and of course we'd supported missions, but I had never experienced the developing world. And uh, so uh, he ended up getting me over to Ethiopia. And it was also just around the same time we were looking at um, the Susis were also feeling called uh, into missions too with CBM. So we also went to Rwanda. But when I went to Ethi it was when I went to Ethiopia that, that God wrecked my world for me. Because I came back realizing how privileged we are here in uh, North America. And I just could not imagine saying, I'm going to raise $5 million for pretty bathrooms and a, a bigger worship center. and one. I, just, I, just, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So that was a crisis for me internally. And yet at the same time, we were running at that time three uh, worship services as we were, had a Saturday night service. We had two Sunday morning services. And uh, we needed to go somewhere. And we were really feeling pressure. So I just began to ask the question, is there some other model out there rather than just build bigger? And I just want to say something. There's nothing wrong with the build bigger model. I'm just was asking the question, is there another model out there? And what, what had hit me, you got to remember, I had been here since 1986, and I had looked at some of our other Baptist mission points, other Baptist congregations in Greater Moncton, and I thought to myself, you know, some are doing well, and some are not doing so well. And one congregation that had been dwindling and declining, and we'll use another word later on in our analysis of this congregation, but it was Brentwood United Baptist Church. It had been established in the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s, and it had gone through some crisis, and it had never recovered, and it had basically uh, became invisible in West End uh, Moncton. And uh, some wonderful pastors had, had gone through there, but, but there had, it, it just had been a steady decline, especially in the last 10 years before we began a conversation with them. And I remember watching this church going, I'm out on Salisbury Road, and please gotta understand something. We call that the tip of the tail of the cat of Moncton. Like, like this is not the part of the city that's developed. This is, this is not Northwest Moncton, like where there's malls and Trinity Center and houses are being built, you know. I mean, we got excited if there was one new house built every year. And, and I was thinking, why? And I'll never forget actually when the architect came and looked at our building, I can still remember him. He walked around our property and we were talking about building a $5 million building. And then, and then I'll never forget this. He, he, he walked out to the end of the driveway and there was, a, remember, he, there was a pasture across the street from us. Now we're in the city limits, but there was still farmland all around us. He's looking at the pasture and then he's looking at the three houses that he can only visibly see with his eyes. And he says, how many people come here on Sunday? I said, well, you know, a good Sunday, we can get nearly 500. He goes, how many people come out here? They, they, 500 people come out here? And, uh, and that concerned me, his, his concern. Um, <laughs> I was going, yeah, like, 
this isn't good. So, um, so I can remember that we began to ask this question and as we started to ask the question, um, we started to say, okay, is there another model? And, and this is where I actually, one of the books we recommended in your reading is, we came across the book, um, you know, uh, multi, multi-site churches and the whole, you know, one church, different locations and using technology. And, and there wasn't a lot being written at the time because almost there was a lot of negativity, I'll be honest. Like it was suspect that you would be using video to, to preach and, you know, and things like this. There was, it wasn't warmly embraced. It was almost like I found this clandestine book and I was reading it quietly in the dark in my closet because I didn't want anyone to know that I was actually thinking something like this. But I remember we began to ask the question and, I, and the thing I got also gripped with was not only only our internal pressures of what do we do? I don't want to spend $5 million. How do we still maintain a missional outreach as a church? But I kept looking at a church. I remember driving by Brentwood Baptist Church going, this is right in one of the most well-developed neighborhoods. There's thousands of people around here. There's two schools right within striking distance. Why isn't this church doing something? This church should be blowing its doors off while we should be struggling out on Salisbury Road. I said, we, this is not right. This has got to change. So, so those were the things that began to make shifts in me. Um, and, and I will be honest with you that for me, in the way God has made me as a leader in my gifting, I feel that I've always, I've always at least wanted to ask the question, well, is there another way? And so God began to stir all this up inside of me. So that was chapter one, okay? That sets the stage. Um, It's been this beyond the box thinking um, that I've really appreciated being part of the ministries at the former Allison Church. So I'd just like to define some terms here about what it was we were feeling that God was calling us to do as a congregation now, as we were on this crisis point where, you know, it's not building bigger. Um, You know, what can we do? And I just want to define the terms that we know that in our, you know, Baptist heritage and history, um, that we would hear about, you know, three-point charges, that there would be, you know, three autonomous congregations that would have separate budgets that would have separate constitutions, but they would share a pastor. Well, this was not that. This was not that. And um, we know also, you know, this, um, uh, that some people release congregation members and say, go to a new area and, and plant a new work. And uh, this was not that. Um, this was definitely something different that we felt that God was stirring up uh, in us. It wasn't about starting something at scratch, from scratch. What we were actually proposing, what we were asking, we asked, what if we considered looking at a church that was struggling, that was declining, and I'll even say that was dying? What if we actually approached a church and said, what if we brought our resources together? What if we brought to bear um, all that you have and all that we have? What could God do? Could he do a new thing? What if we were willing to give up our unique identities and become something new, have a new identity? What if we recognize that your church could still be a viable mission point because of where you are at and where God has placed you in that community? What if it could still be a mission point? Well, we recognize that our church was still wrestling with, you know, um, How do we remain outwardly focused in the midst of what we were going through at the time? And it was the whole idea, as Dave said, you know, how do we, you know, how do we be be good stewards of what God has given us? And so here is a, even a church building um, that that right now is not being used to its capacity and its God-given potential within that neighborhood. So it was also a stewardship question. Good stewards of what was already there. We wondered, is there, you know, a sister Baptist church that's struggling, but is in a strategic location that would be open to something new and very different? Could this really happen? Could we do something different? 
And so we did come across this multi-site model of one church with different locations, not many churches with one pastor. And that's a fundamental difference we find in this particular missional model, in this new structure. So it meant approaching a church, and in this case, it was the Brentwood United Baptist Church, and saying, you know, you have to give up something in order to gain something. I mean, isn't that what scripture says? You know, if you, if you want to have your life, we have to lose something. There's always a sacrifice involved for a, a greater missional idea. So what that meant practically, and this is the piece where everybody goes, <gasps> but this is what it meant. We were asking them to sign over their title, to sign over their deed, to hand over the keys, to sign over the bank accounts, all of the resources, to hand us the building, to allow us to go in and do drastic renovations. The pews had to be removed. The organ went. Are you catching the gravity of what was, ha was going to happen here? This was a big, a big, big deal. This is what we were asking. New lighting, new flooring. And all of us who are part of the Baptist community here, you would give up your autonomy. <gasps> I hear the hush in the room. There's a kind of hush. So we were actually saying to the Brentwood United Baptist Church that was established in the 1950s, that was a church plant in that community, would you be willing to let go of that identity? Would you be willing to let go and say, I'm willing to lose my church understanding, my understanding of how to do church, that would all have to change. And would you dare to be part of something new? Something new. Would you hand that over? Now, we weren't asking them to remove their presence. It wasn't like we were saying, shut down your building and come join us. That's another option. But that wasn't what we were saying. We wanted that missional presence to stay there. The building was there. The community that surrounded it was a, a thriving community. And would they do that? We didn't want to remove their presence, but rather we wanted them to go through a transformation, a metamorphosis. You know, something new could happen. Like a caterpillar to a butterfly. And that was the shift. That was part of the shift that God um, was making happen. Quick review. Chapter 1, the catalyst. Chapter 2, the shift. Now again, I just want to say to those who are watching this live stream, or those who are here, again, um, if we're saying something, and I, I know that in a way, when we start telling a story, each each local church, in a sense, has its own little bit of dialect. And we may have terminologies, or we may th make a throwaway statement that may not be clear to you, or you want some clarification. So again, we want to encourage you, if you want to tweet a question to us, we'll take a break during our chapters and uh, you know, say, well, let's just take a moment and ask that question. So are there any tweets yet? Yeah, we have a couple that were in. One, uh, Kevin Vincent says, keep going. And uh, <laughs> he's cheering you on. Thank he also, you, Kev. He, uh, well, he used a couple hashtags about you. You can read later. But okay, anyway. thank you. Um, but a question from Andrew Myers who says, how do we still maintain a missional outlook while needing to expand? Uh, gosh, um, do you want to take a run at that? How do we maintain a missional outlook? Yeah, I think he was referring back to when you were talking about your experience yes. uh, that you went on. And, yeah, oh. you know, so I, and it, you're with the church that you were yeah. still very involved in missions. But yeah. So how did you balance those two competing needs? Um, well, all, my quick answer is this, is that um, it was a very stressful time uh, because there was a tendency that as we were going through and trying to continue to invite people in, um, we realized that our capacity um, was, was shrinking and 
and it was stressful. And we, in a sense, we realized all of our systems that we needed in place, not just our building systems, but all our systems were getting stretched. Church in Moncton, so uh, let's do it. We're going to catch those Wesleyans, you know, sort of thing. And uh, I was like, whoa, $5 million. Well, then, uh, as I was wrestling with that, um, I, another disruptive thing came into my life. Uh, Dr. Andy Barnes uh, was a professor at the time at Lang Baptist University, and uh, which is now Crandall, obviously, and he was attending our church along with he and his wife and family, and he said, Dave, you need to go to the developing world. As, I mean, at that stage of life, I'd been so busy just working my local church, and of course we'd supported missions, but I had never experienced the developing world. And uh, so uh, he ended up getting me over to Ethiopia. And it was also just around the same time we were looking at um, the Susis were also feeling called uh, into missions too with CBM. So we also went to Rwanda. But when I went to Ethi it was when I went to Ethiopia that, that God wrecked my world for me. Because I came back realizing how privileged we are here in uh, North America. And I just could not imagine saying, I'm going to raise $5 million for pretty bathrooms and a, a bigger worship center. and one. I, just, I, just, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. So that was a crisis for me internally. And yet at the same time, we were running at that time three uh, worship services as we were, had a Saturday night service. We had two Sunday morning services. And uh, we needed to go somewhere. And we were really feeling pressure. So I just began to ask the question, is there some other model out there rather than just build bigger? And I just want to say something. There's nothing wrong with the build bigger model. I am just was asking the question, is there another model out there? And what, what had hit me, you got to remember, I had been here since 1986, and I had looked at some of our other Baptist mission points, other Baptist congregations in Greater Moncton, and I thought to myself, you know, some are doing well, and some are not doing so well. And one congregation that had been dwindling and declining, and we'll use another word later on in our analysis of this congregation, but it was Brentwood United Baptist Church. It had been established in the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s, and it had gone through some crisis, and it had never recovered, and it had basically uh, became invisible in West End uh, Moncton. And uh, some wonderful pastors had, had gone through there, but, but there had, it, it just had been a steady decline, especially in the last 10 years before we began a conversation with them. And I remember watching this church going, I'm out on Salisbury Road, and please gotta understand something. We call that the tip of the tail of the cat of Moncton. Like, like this is not the part of the city that's developed. This is, this is not Northwest Moncton, like where there's malls and Trinity Center and houses are being built, you know. I mean, we got excited if there was one new house built every year. And, and I was thinking, why? And I'll never forget actually when the architect came and looked at our building, I can still remember him. He walked around our property and we were talking about building a $5 million building. And then, and then I'll never forget this. He, he, he walked out to the end of the driveway and there was, a, remember, he, there was a pasture across the street from us. Now we're in the city limits, but there was still farmland all around us. And he's looking at the pasture and then he's looking at the three houses that he can only visibly see with his eyes. And he says, how many people come here on Sunday? I said, well, you know, a good Sunday, we can get nearly 500. He goes, how many people come out here? They, they, 500 people come out here? And, uh, and that concerned me, his, his concern. Um, <laughs> I, I was going, yeah, like, this isn't good. So, um, so I can remember that we began to ask this question. And as we started to ask the question, um, we started to say, okay, is there another model? And, and this is where I actually, one of the books we recommended in your reading is, we came across the book, um, you know, uh, multi, multi-site churches and the whole, you know, one church, different locations and using technology. And, and there wasn't a lot being written at the time because almost there was a lot of negativity, I'll be honest. Like it was suspect that you would be using video to, to preach and, you know, and things like this. There was, it wasn't warmly embraced. It was almost like I found this clandestine book and I was reading it quietly in the dark in my closet because I didn't want anyone to know that I was actually thinking something like this. But I remember we began to ask the question and, I, and the thing I got also gripped with was not only 
only our internal pressures of what do we do? I don't want to spend $5 million. How do we still maintain a missional outreach as a church? But I kept looking at a church. I remember driving by Brentwood Baptist Church going, this is right in one of the most well-developed neighborhoods. There's thousands of people around here. There's two schools right within striking distance. Why isn't this church doing something? This church should be blowing its doors off while we should be struggling out on Salisbury Road. I said, we, this is not right. This has got to change. So, so those were the things that began to make shifts in me. Um, and, and I will be honest with you that for me, in the way God has made me as a leader in my gifting, I feel that I've always, I've always at least wanted to ask the question, well, is there another way? And so God began to stir all this up inside of me. So that was chapter one, okay? That sets the stage. Um, it's been this beyond the box thinking um, that I've really appreciated being part of the ministries at the former Allison Church. So I'd just like to define some terms here about what it was we were feeling that God was calling us to do as a congregation now, as we were on this crisis point where, you know, it's not building bigger. Um, you know, what can we do? And I just want to define the terms that we know that in our, you know, Baptist heritage and history, um, that we would hear about, you know, three-point charges, that there would be, you know, three autonomous congregations that would have separate budgets that would have separate constitutions, but they would share a pastor. Well, this was not that. This was not that. Um, we know also, you know, this, um, uh, that some people release congregation members and say, go to a new area and, and plant a new work. And uh, this was not that. Um, this was definitely something different that we felt that God was stirring up uh, in us. It wasn't about starting something at scra from scratch. What we were actually proposing, what we were asking, we asked, what if we considered looking at a church that was struggling, that was declining, and I'll even say that was dying? What if we actually approached a church and said, what if we brought our resources together? What if we brought to bear um, all that you have and all that we have? What could God do? Could he do a new thing? What if we were willing to give up our unique identities and become something new, have a new identity? What if we recognize that your church could still be a viable mission point because of where you are at and where God has placed you in that community? What if it could still be a mission point? Well, we recognize that our church was still wrestling with, you know, um, how do we remain outwardly focused in the midst of what we were going through at the time? And it was the whole idea, as Dave said, you know, how do we, you know, how do we be, be good stewards of what God has given us? And so here is a, even a church building um, that, that right now is not being used to its capacity and its God-given potential within that neighborhood. So it was also a stewardship question. Good stewards of what was already there. We wondered, is there, you know, a sister Baptist church that's struggling, but is in a strategic location that would be open to something new and very different? Could this really happen? Could we do something different? And so we did come across this multi-site model of one church with different locations, not many churches with one pastor. And that's a fundamental difference we find in this particular missional model, in this new structure. So it meant approaching a church, and in this case, it was the Brentwood United Baptist Church, and saying, you know, you have to give up something in order to gain something. I mean, isn't that what scripture says? You know, if you, if you want to have your life, we have to lose something. There's always a sacrifice involved for a, a greater missional idea. So what that meant practically, and this is the piece where everybody goes, <gasps> but this is what it meant. We were asking them to sign over their title, to sign over their deed, to hand over the keys, 
to sign over the bank accounts, all of the resources, to hand us the building, to allow us to go in and do drastic renovations. The pews had to be removed. The organ went. Are you catching the gravity of what was, ha was going to happen here? This was a big, a big, big deal. This is what we were asking. New lighting, new flooring. And all of us who are part of the Baptist community here, you would give up your autonomy. <gasps> I hear the hush in the room. There's a kind of hush. So we were actually saying to the Brentwood United Baptist Church that was established in the 1950s, that was a church plant in that community, would you be willing to let go of that identity? Would you be willing to let go and say, I'm willing to lose my church understanding, my understanding of how to do church, that would all have to change. And would you dare to be part of something new? Something new. Would you hand that over? Now, we weren't asking them to remove their presence. It wasn't like we were saying, shut down your building and come join us. That's another option. But that wasn't what we were saying. We wanted that missional presence to stay there. The building was there. The community that surrounded it was a, a thriving community. And would they do that? We didn't want to remove their presence, but rather we wanted them to go through a transformation, a metamorphosis. You know, something new could happen. Like a caterpillar to a butterfly. And that was the shift. That was part of the shift that God um, was making happen. Quick review. Quick review. Chapter 1, the catalyst. Chapter 2, the shift. Now again, I just want to say to those who are watching this live stream or those who are here, again, um, if we're saying something, and I, I know that in a way when we start telling a story, each each local church, in a sense, has its own little bit of dialect. And we may have terminologies or we may th make a throwaway statement that may not be clear to you or you want some clarification. So again, we want to encourage you, if you want to tweet a question to us, we'll take a break during our chapters and uh, you know, say, well, let's just take a moment and ask that question. So are there any tweets yet? Yeah, we have a couple that were in. One, uh, Kevin Vincent says, keep going. And uh, <laughs> he's cheering you on. Thank he also, you, Kev. He, uh, well, he used a couple of hashtags about you. You can read later. But okay, anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, but a question from Andrew Myers who says, how do we still maintain a missional outlook while needing to expand? Uh, gosh, um, do you want to take a run at how do we maintain a missional outlook? Yeah, I think he was referring back to when you were talking about your experience yes. uh, that you went on. And, yeah. oh. you know, so I, and it, you're with the church that you were yeah. still very involved in missions. But yeah. So how did you balance those two competing needs? Um, well, all, my, my quick answer is this, is that um, it was a very stressful time uh, because there was a tendency that as we were going through and trying to continue to invite people in, um, we realized that our capacity um, was, was shrinking and, and it was stressful. And we, in a sense, we realized all of our systems that we needed in place, not just our building systems, but all our systems were getting stretched. Uh, it was, in, in fact, um, uh, and this actually came through a visioning process that we went through, um, but one of the pictures they used, remember this uh, picture they used was, apparently at a Home Depot one time, someone with a, a small car, like a Volkswagen, uh, apparently was doing building renovations and they loaded up the trunk with uh, cement bags and everything. And then they put all this wood on top of it. And apparently it, was, it made it about 100 feet from the loading dock and the axles literally broke. And there's this picture that they found, you know, they took of the Volkswagen just you know, crumpled with uh, this load. And I, I, and I remember we were going through a visioning process and someone came up with this picture and that was our stress that we had. And, and all I could say is you just 
try to deal with it to the best of your ability is, is my, my quick answer. Okay, well, look, that, that's good. So again, we want to encourage, again, keep the uh, tweets coming and uh, Kevin, I'll look at your hashtags later. Um, so so uh, chapter three, the conversations began. Um, we we want, realized that we were going to now start engaging in this conversation with this declining church and this new opportunity. Uh, this, this is an important chapter. And this is one of those things that um, this started, uh, we've been doing now the multi-site model for about six and a half years, but this conversation started about eight years ago. And again, and I was reminded by what Dr. McMullen said today, that at the end of the day, when renewal happens, God has to be at work, that you just cannot orchestrate this stuff. It has to be at work. So long story short, the, the, at that point, um, uh, Brentwood, uh, the Brentwood Baptist Church had come to a point of, of decline that they could no longer afford a full-time pastor. And so they realized that they probably could afford a half-time pastor. And at that moment, and, and again, some of you know these, these names, but Dr. Seth Kroll was a member of the Brentwood Baptist Church, and he was good friends with another professor at Crandall University, Dr. Sam Reimer, who was the, one of the spiritual leaders at the Mennonite Church over in Riverview, a River of Life Church that has been there for about 20 plus years. And they're good friends, and they decided, well, could we share a pastor between us, even though we're two different denominations? And, uh, but, you know, Mennonites, we, 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 we love them, and they, they certainly are peaceable with us. And, um, and so anyway, uh, Seth and, and Sam uh, approached uh, Brent Hudson, who actually uh, grew up in our Baptist denomination and came to faith in our Baptist denomination, actually in Fredericton uh, and whatnot, and then um, found his way into the Mennonite denomination, but he found his way back to Moncton, and here he was working at ROL, and anyway, they came up with this, this opportunity. Now, here's the neat part about Brent Hudson. Brent, when he was in high school, was the best friend of my younger brother, Donald. And I can remember Brent, we ran into each other when he first moved back to Moncton. And Brent says, you know, I, I, I want to get together and talk sometime and see what's going on. I hear things are going good at Allison Church and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, yeah, let's, let's look forward. Actually, we just want to catch up from our knowing him way back in my earlier high school days. Well, all of a sudden I realized there was an opportunity. Because I remember when I thought about trying to have this conversation with any other Baptist pastor, and I want to be very kind when I say this, but with any other Baptist pastor to say, I know your church is declining and we're growing and like, can we do a multi-site thing? It really wasn't a good way to start a conversation. Because, because the tendency, and I just want you to feel the emotion of it for a moment. I think most of us would say, you know, I thank you very, well, not even thank you very much. Uh, shut the door. We'll do our thing, and you can go keep doing your crazy thing that you're doing out in Salisbury Road. And yet, Brent, I realized, was the first pastor with the Brentwood Church that I could actually have this conversation, and he wouldn't blow me off. So I can remember, it just came down to this. So I, I said, Brent, you want to have coffee? I said, you want to have coffee with me? I, I'd like to have coffee with you, Brett. And we went at Tim Horton's on West Main Street, and we sat down. I can still remember this day. And we sat down. I said, Brent, I said, I got something crazy I want to talk about. I said, I said, you know, I don't want to build a bigger church. And I've been reading, doing some reading on this multi-site model. And I said, would you be crazy enough? Would you, would you be crazy enough to get your congregation to come into a conversation with us and just to see where it's going to take us. So, and, and here's the thing. Brent knew me enough that, that despite my personality, which at times can come across as obnoxious, um, at times, um, he knew me enough, he knew my heart enough to say, you know what, I think I'd be up for that. Because he did tell the Brentwood Baptist Church one thing. He said, even though I'm half time for you, he says, if you're just wanting to hire a chaplain to wait until you die, he goes, don't hire me. He says, I want to be open to what God wants to do here. And it could be anything. 
He didn't even know what he was saying he said at the time, but he said he remember telling them that. And they, of course, said, oh, yes, yes, Brent, whatever, which is code for nothing's going to happen, so we're good. And then, and then um, I went in a course, and here's the other thing, and this is where I do think, and it's funny, as I look out among you, we're all interrelated in our work, and I think this is actually something we need to leverage more. Because when I talk about Dr. Seth Crow, he was the, on the deacon's board, the small deacon's board of the Brentwood Baptist Church, and here is the beauty of this. His dad married Nancy and me. We knew, he taught me in my first year. He was my basketball coach at ABC. Um, he watched me get fouled out of game after game after game. Um, you know, he knew me. His family knew me. His family knew Nancy's family very well. They said, obviously Dave can't be that bad married to Nancy. As he brought me a lot of street cred with the crawls. And, and, and as all that kind of merged together, so I remember going to Seth at his office up at Crandall University saying, Seth, I want to have a conversation with Brent. Are you willing to step into this conversation? And we started the conversation. Now here's the thing. There was a tremendous amount of distrust when I walked in. Because at this time, we were probably the largest Baptist church in Moncton at that moment. And they were one of the smallest. They felt intimidated. They felt insecure. Look, I know the feelings of jealousy. I know what it's like going to conferences and listening to other pastors talk and going, yeah, but what, yeah, right. And I can write them off quickly, theologically, Psychological, I've got to slay them. And you might be doing that to me right now. I mean, I'll, uh, God bless you if you are. Just don't let me know. But the thing is, is that we went into conversations, and I can remember we met the deacons at the time, met with our lead team at the time. That was our code word for deacons. And we came together, and we started a conversation where we met once every two weeks, by week, bi monthly, so yeah, once every two weeks, for the next 18 months. 18 months of talking, working through, and, and those, were, those were robust discussions. Because we had to, in those discussions, do a lot of different things. We had to define reality. We had to do a whole bunch of things. And, 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 and let me just, how much time do I have on two and a half minutes? Okay, so let, let me just highlight three critical things that we did during those conversations. This is chapter three, having the conversations. The first thing is you really, if you're going to pull people together for really what I call creative, visionary, beyond the box thinking to do missional work, you've got to have a structure to allow that conversation to happen. Otherwise, it's just going to be like popcorn and go crazy on you and no, one's no, no one is going to know what to do with it. So obviously, like you heard last night, there's the SWOT analysis, there's all that. We used, and here's a book that didn't get onto your digital reading list, but it's called Simplex by Dr. Min Brazor, B-R-A-S-U-R, I believe, Dr. Min Brazor, just you can Google the Simplex. And it's a creative eight-step process of having creative uh, discussion where you diverge and then converge and diverge and converge to a moment of action, okay? It's, it's not, I, I don't know if it's, I don't think you're going to find it in scripture, but it's just a good model for creating conversation and moving a group of people through so you keep the conversation moving. Otherwise, we would have just spun, okay? So um, that's critical. Have a, pro have a process for conversation. The second one is have patience. And I mean, obviously me telling you that we took 18 months was critical. Um, I'm just yeah, going to yeah, jump I want, in. Yeah, I want you to, yeah. Have patience. Um, at this point, I just wanted to, I, we talked about this, and there's the story of when we as a leadership team, sorry, Dave, as a leadership team, we went into the Brentwood Baptist Church. So there were probably about 30 or 40 of us. Um, if about 40 of us that went in to meet with the people who were part of that church. So we probably outnumbered them quite a bit. I'm sure it was, you know, uh, four to one. 
It was a four to one ratio. Um, so you can imagine that. But anyway, this was a time where the leadership groups would get together, that we would dream, we would pray, we would talk about, you know, what could the new day look like? What are we going to do? Is this a possibility? Is God calling us, both uh, churches, to this new idea, this new dream? And I can remember at the end, as we all do in our Baptist churches, what did we do? We stood up and formed a circle and held hands. We were getting ready to pray and sing what song? Blessed be, right online, you know, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. And I saw one of the, the spouses of the leadership of Brentwood get up and leave. And what happened was a friend of hers followed her right out, right out into the Welcome Center. And I'm a, I'm a feeler, I'm a high relational person, and I don't like it when there's upset and tension, but I thought, I gotta go out, and I followed her right out into the Welcome Center at the time. And I just, and, and she was so upset, so upset. She was so, um, it just it, all the emotions were bubbling, all the pain uh, was coming to the top about this reality that she was not happy about. And I remember just saying to them, oh, oh, please stay, please stay. And then I remember the full force winds that I received. And Dave, I think my eyebrows were singed. Uh, but, but she had to let it go. She had to let loose. Um, I had to allow her to express what she was experiencing at that moment. She was experiencing intense pain about what was going on at that time. And I just remember I had to have a posture of patience and a posture of compassion at that moment to allow her um, to just outlet at that time. So when we're talking about this, we're not talking about la la la, tree dee dee, there's peace and goodwill. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have sung. Anyway, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, it, at that moment I thought, all is not going to be smooth in this transition. There are going to be some bumpy rides and we are dealing with people's um, re new realities. Well, here. well, like, uh, um, <laughs> well, well, like, like, like John, Dr. John McAnally spoke today about oh, how we had to move from hostility, hostility to hospitality. hospitality. Yes, there was. There and was and Dr. John McNally, that was hostility yes, at that, that moment. Yeah, that was hostility, I experienced yes. that. Yes. Um, but, and, 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 and here's the old, one other thing in this time of having conversations. So you need a structure, you need really compassionate patience. And the third thing you need, and this is the biggest one, and again, it's trust. And trust at one, you know, I'm convinced that one of the signs of renewal in the life of our Atlantic Baptist family is going to be we start trusting each other more. There's not this knee-jerk response to cynicism, criti critique. We give each other the benefit of the doubt. Um, and, and I just think that I was reminded, ironically, that I was able to have a conversation with two critical spiritual leaders so that, and, and the reason why they let me in their inner room to talk about this dream was because there was trust, there was mutual trust. I, I, I knew when they would go back, they weren't going to you know, backstab me. They knew I wasn't going to backstab them. I, I, I trusted them implicitly and, and I, I felt they did with me as well. And, and, and I'm just thinking that as you navigate these big creative missional changes that I think we have to start embracing more, um, we really have to see this, 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 this money of trust that we have to start building up. We have to be really paying attention to that. Okay. Chapter four. Chapter four. Are there any questions that we find that oh, we yes. field before yes. I begin chapter four? Isn't this fun? So I'm having the time of my life, I must say. There's a great conversation going on. So Garth Williams, aside of being a little twitchy about losing autonomy. Okay, um, thank you, Garth. He, he kind of asked the question, so you've talked about what Brentwood was being asked to <laughs> give up. What was Allison giving up? And then kind of on top of that, Kevin Vincent came back and asked, did you have to take all their assets? Right, so there's that, there, there's that loss. You, you, asked, you asked them to give up. You said everything, 
Um, and so what did Allison mm. have to give up? Yes, and I'm coming to that in chapter four about choices. So Garth, if you can wait just a moment, because oftentimes that's where we would focus on. We would think, oh, well, it's just Brentwood that's giving up um, something. And I'm going to speak to that in a moment because that was the piece I don't think that we were really prepared for, um, what we were going to have to give up, what Allison was going to have to give up. It's and so all the assets, yes. Something similar that. that Lois Mitchell brings up. It says, were you concerned that this might be a colonial mentality? A colonial mentality. <gasps> mm. Did you feel that it was, did, were you concerned? Okay, I'll let you speak. To I, I did not feel it was, we were, be, you know, we were Great Britain taking over India or anything like that. But I, I think for us, it was about, we needed alignment. And alignment for us meant we were all in it together with everything rather than I have my thing, you have your thing, and we can, it wasn't just holding hands, it's we're in this together. It's, it really was in, in one way, it was like a, a marriage, you know, and, and that's a poor analogy at one level, but it was we're all in this together, no one's holding anything back, and um, yeah, so it wasn't colonization, I would say, but, but that, that's it my could initial point. I think it. I think it could be perceived that way for sure. Um, but I think the marriage analogy, uh, how that does work out, is, you know, the two become one. Um, but obviously, um, it's more complementarian. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about chapter four before I get into more trouble. <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble here. Um, no, it, and it had to be agreed upon mutually, right? Um, um, it had to be ch agreed upon and voted upon mutually. So it wasn't, you know, someone who was a victim of a takeover. It was definitely something that was worked through. Actually, Carolyn, just, mm. um, you know, I, I, I do think, and just before Carolyn gets into the yeah. choices, that one of the things we had to work through were what I would call the knee-jerk emotional reactions and one thing that I was absolutely convinced of, and I, would, I, would, I will um, converse with anybody about this afterwards in more detail, but you know, one of the toughest things I had to deal with the first couple months is everybody kept joking, saying, oh, here comes Dave the Borg. And those of you who are Trekkie fans know that, you know, we will assimilate you. And I had to kind of a bar that, overlook that, and get, you know, and let people say that to get it out of their system. But at some point we had to address it and say, this is not about assimilation. This is about us all creating a whole brand new identity. We're all going to be affected by this if we end up going down this road, which leads to go. <laughs> Chapter four, choices. <sighs> we could actually write a book. That's coming, I can feel it. So after the conversations, you know, after the talk, choices had to be made. And so here we had the Brentwood United Baptist Church had to make some choices. And so did the Allison Baptist Church have to make some choices. So I'm going to talk about the Brentwood side first, and then I'll get to the Allison side. So the story is reported to me secondhand by some very critical, credible sources and what happened um, the night that the congregation of the Brentwood United Baptist Church got together. Um, I wasn't in the meetings myself, but it's my understanding that when they had the vote with their 25 or 30 members presence, present, it was not unanimous. And the point that I want to make here on that point is, you know, we heard a presenter yesterday talk about how they went through a tremendous amount of structural change as a church and, and how they were able to get through this change with little, maybe even no casualties. There were no losses to their church uh, membership. No people left. And I found that absolutely um, what, a, what a blessing of a story that is. And I think that whenever we're approaching any kind of large change like this, structure and, and even what we were proposing, I think that that should be our ultimate motivation and ultimate goal, actually, is to try to move these through these times where we don't lose anybody. And so the vote, as I say, it was not a unanimous vote. 
And what do you do as you navigate large changes without losing anyone? If that is your goal and you don't want to lose anyone, on one hand, I want to say, yes, that should be our goal. We should try to bring everybody with us. But what happens if not everybody wants to go? What happens if there are some people who just aren't on board with that? And I think what can happen at those moments is, especially when we're on the cusp of maybe, you know, a, a whole new missional opportunity, a whole new opportunity to reach people for Christ, we can let the fear of losing some people paralyze us. And please hear me, hear me clearly. I don't relish in the thought of people leaving a church. That is not, that is not what we would ever want. But if a church is deciding to move into a direction and there are some who are just not willing to go, don't want to go, you know, is that a point where we say, well, let's just shut it all down? Is that what we should do? And that's the question, you know, that Brentwood had to ask at that time. That was a huge, a huge question for this. And this is the tension that we're in. And that was Brentwood's reality at the time. That meant then that there were people who actually did leave. They did leave the church. That meant that the fellowship that some of the people had in that church family for many, many years, that that was now going to, that was going to end. That was going to be broken now. And I just want to just, I think my point here is that when these choices, these hard choices are made for the sake of the kingdom, and that is the heart of what these choices were all about. The sake of the kingdom, things are not going to be clean. Things are not going to be clear at times. Things are going to get messy. And I think that's what can paralyze us as churches. We don't like a mess. We want everything clean and tidy. But remember, ministry is messy. And when we're, you know, on mission... We have to expect that there are going to be people who are just not going to go with us. And we have to expect that the enemy is at work. And we have to just expect that things are going to be difficult at times. And can we push through those points is the question. Can we push through them? And not in an arrogant way and not in a way that says, oh, well, they're gone. See you later. No, you can believe. In fact, we had one family who actually stayed for a year after the transition and said, you know what, we're going to give this an honest try. And you know, I really hail them for doing that. I think that was a really, um, that was an authentic way to say, you know what, this just is not for us. So when they came together and they said they were going to vote, and the vote was going to challenge at that moment what they were actually voting on, was that they were going to make mission the most important value and even if it meant that some friends were going to walk away. And that's difficult in our culture. I'm not saying that it was to be either, you know, um, either or what wins the day. Is it friendship? Friendship wins the day? I mean, I'm a highly relational person. For me, you know, I would find that a really difficult decision to make. Because the Brentwood Church would say, we're friendly. It's like Dr. McMullen said at his session, his, his, you know, they were a really friendly church. It's just that they were only friendly with each other. And so they were friendly. And so this whole process allowed them to actually think, well, which is more important here? What are we going to, what's going to be the weight on this decision? What is the choice that we're going to be making here? Are we going to choose to be on mission? And not everyone agreed on how this mission was to be accomplished. And so they had the reality that people walked. So that was a result of the choice that they made when they voted. And then the Allison Baptist Church, Allison Church at the time, they had choices. They had to redefine success. Because let's face it, at this time, we were experiencing, you know, what uh, we would call success in our context. We would have to give up the idea of one big church with everybody all together. 
Oh, we love it with everybody together. Don't, we don't want to split up everybody, you know? So this whole idea, and you know, the excitement of a big building program, that's exciting. It's something we can all get on board. Come on. And so that meant we had to give up, you know, also our name and our identity. And this was something that I think people, they were kind of asleep when we were talking about all this. It's like, what? We, we, what? we have to give, give up our identity? What? Give up Allison? No way. It meant we had to consider all these things, that we have to give up the model of mission that we were used to and that was being successful that we were now engaging in a model that for Atlantic Canada at that time, it was still very new at that time. And we know that there are other examples in various ways, but in our context, this was brand new territory that we'd never gone down before. And so we were asking the Allison congregation to walk away from a proven form of success. And let me tell you what the formula was. Oh my goodness, we had uh, stars on the stage. Can you believe that I was actually the host? I know that's hard for you to believe. I'd come up on the stage and I'd say, welcome everybody, and I had the tear off tab, and I said, come and get a gift if you're new, and we're glad you're here. And then we had our worship pastor, John Ferguson, come out and engage people with wonderful worship music. And then we had our, our wonderful lead pastor, who's an A-plus communicator, come out, and he'd preach a word that people could walk away and actually apply to their lives. We had the winning combination, people online. It was the winning combination. And so with this model, we were saying to our people, we're going to give this up. We're actually going to throw all this back in the box. And it means that this star-studded team and other leadership along with us, we're now going to be dispersed in a different way. So we lost people. (laughs) And you've probably all heard the stories. We lost people because it wasn't the model anymore that, was, that people liked. And from the conflict that ensued from the Allison side with the name change and all that was going on at that time, we lost close to 200 people. Please grow one more time. <laughs> I did a lot of growing. Here we were on the cusp of being 600 plus. Here we were on the cusp. And we were down to 350 or 400 people. And I think, Pastor Perry, we're going to look at your Project 99. That's very timely. So this was a sacrifice, but we felt that this was where God was calling us. And so what we learned in this journey, and we have to keep reminding ourselves that every new chapter we move into, even now, you need to have plans, you need to have discussions, but then there does come a time where you have to make the choices. And those choices oftentimes are difficult choices, and it can lead to messy times. And it's that point that you have to move, though, You have to act, you have to choose. And so for Brentwood, they had to transfer their ownership, give up their identity and assets, and some friends who walked. And for Allison, we had to let go of our identity as well and take the risk and say, let's go down this road. And so ends chapter four. So, um, any any questions, John, or we'll wait till the end of chapter five. Uh, a couple of really good comments, but um, one of them coming from Nick Phillips, saying from the United Church Canada point of view, uh, who he's watching this uh, this evening, said the Simpson sessions is very intriguing, and he's um, bombarded with ideas. So, uh, the impact we're having here is is crossing borders. Uh, one question uh, from Lois saying that the, the woman that was upset. She wants you to finish the story. Was she won over? What happened to her? Um, Can we have a Paul Harvey moment here? There is the rest of the story, but... I'll wait. I'll wait. So Lois, we'll answer that, but it's part of our dramatic conclusion (laughs) that will bring tears and, you know, the whole nine yards. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, there's Lois. Okay. Spoiler alert. alert. That's right. There's there's a there's a there's a spoiler alert. Um. So, uh, so the, okay, so here we were. So the, vote, the votes were taken, uh, this decision was made, and we're in the new day, and here we are. And, um, and I just want to just take a moment and describe for you what that new day looked for us. So I'm gonna do a little bit of just sort of descriptive language, a little bit of technical language around how we were operating, but hopefully this will at least help you understand, because I do find that when people talk to us about our multi-site, I recognize multi-site has so many different mutations and variations. We'll just tell you how ours um, expressed itself. So um, when we moved into our multi-site, we said, okay, we're gonna have two services at our Allison campus on Salisbury Road. Uh, we'll have one on Saturday night where that will be the message that will be uh, videotaped. And then on Sunday morning, that m- videotape message will play, be played at the 11 o'clock service at either Brentwood or at the Allison campus. We initially made a commitment to both, con- you know, to all the congregations. We said, now, if you want to see the preaching live all the time, come to the Saturday night service. Right? That's what we said. I mean, that's a guarantee. It will be live. And uh, I was obviously the primary uh, speaker, preacher, teacher, but we also had a preaching team at that time, including Carolyn, including Brent Hudson, and including some other uh, voices as well, which we, to this day, we still do until Carolyn has gone off now to St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, so we would make sure that that would be, again, the, the live preach would happen Saturday night, then it would be uh, video cast on Sunday morning at one of the respective uh, services. Now, now for Pastor Carolyn, um, she became, in, in October of 2008, she became the campus pastor. And we had uh, looked through the dynamics and uh, she had just started her, actually her pastoral studies uh, just the year before. She was working out her calling and we just thought, here's a great opportunity. Because again, and I, I just want to talk real here as a Baptist uh, churches. We are not, you know, uh, in, in w- as much as we're more wealthier than the countries like Ethiopia, we're still not in the wealthy, you know, city areas of some other churches I've seen and been at. But we were trying to make the best use of our resources that we had at the time. Um, and so we worked out with Carolyn. We said, Carolyn, let's make this a win-win. Um, you can pursue your studies. You can be getting all this pastoral experience. Uh, you're going to be helping us uh, define this new, new paradigm, new reality. Uh, so you, we'll make you our campus pastor. She was working about 25 hours a week. And then, Carolyn, you have time now to pursue your studies. And, and, all, that extra time. and all that extra time. And, of course, it was 25 pastoral hours, which we all know what that really means. And, um, but, but, but Carolyn uh, plunged into it. Uh, <laughs> plunged. No other way to say it. And, uh, and, and her role was that Carolyn is a campus pastor at the Brentwood campus, which is that one, um, and, that's the, and that's the Allison one. Yeah. But at the campus one, she was responsible to um, oversee, uh, develop, implement whatever ministries would be happening at that congregation and that campus, uh, but coordinate with the rest of the leadership team that gave her support for the overall Journey Church Ministries. You know, be it operational, be it, uh, you know, media, be it uh, youth ministries, next-gen ministries, whatever. Um, my role in this new multi-site reality was I was carrying two hats really at this time uh, in this new day and I didn't realize actually how heavy one hat would be compared to one. Um, now I was carrying the hat of not only just being the lead pastor and all giving oversight to the overall ministries of the church but I was also the campus pastor at the, at the Salisbury Road Church. So, I, so those pastoral needs, those pastoral conversations, those pastoral connections, I was still trying to manage that. I will be honest with you, that has been one of our biggest bugbears. That is bad, bad, and bad. And I look at Kevin and I'm jealous that he's got two pastors managing at the campuses where he, his dynamic at ACC is. But, because that has been, that's just, that's just, yeah, it's just not great. Um, Essentially, for the first number of years, we did try to go with this 50% live video at all the services. Um, at times, we evolved and experimented, even pushing it up for a time. And I'll be honest with you, part of it was that I was getting overburdened uh, with all my other responsibilities. So we pushed the vi- more videos at Carolyn's because he- here's the reality, and this is one of our problems. Um, on the Sundays that I would go over and preach live at the Brentwood campus at 11 o'clock, 
Who was the pastoral president at the, Atlanta, uh, at the Allison campus on Salisbury Road? But you see, so, so Carolyn was always the campus pastor at the Brentwood. Then I would show up over here so they would get double, double duty and double they glory. Double dip. The, yeah, right, double dip. And over here, the Allison campus, who had sent people over here, who had embraced this model, are going, what about us? And there was some murmuring. <laughs> so we had, we had some issues to go through all that. And one of the things, too, that we struggled with was this. All the models we looked at, a lot of these models were like, you know, 20 miles apart, 15 miles apart, 100 miles apart. We were seven minutes apart or 10 minutes apart, depending on the weather driving conditions. Sped. Yeah, if you sped. And, and what we were trying to do is really maintain a separation. But as over the last six years, we're starting to realize what does, a, what does it mean being seven to 10 minutes apart really mean? Which means we're closer in geographical proximity, which means we just have to live in that reality. Um, you know, one of our challenges during this multi-site time, and I will say this, when you have a campus pastor, and Carolyn struggled with this, and I struggled with it too, was, okay, who's really responsible for what? And who really has the voice in the room? And at times, I would intentionally try not to show up in the room so Carolyn could be the campus pastor for her congregation because she always felt like, well, when I step in the room, I might as well just sit down and shut up because here's Dave. And I don't mean shut up. I just mean no. Dave, Dave's, in, Dave's in front. I got to be quiet. And that's, that wasn't good either. So we, we had to talk that through, work that through, figure that out. Um, one thing we saw evolve too was that it took time. Initially, we thought we would approach it this way. We wanted to tell people, look, we got three, we got three services a weekend. We got a Saturday night. We got two options on Sunday morning. Just take your pick. You know, just show up wherever you want. Well, we realized that really wasn't good for creating community after a while. And we realized along the way, probably about year two or three, we've got to start asking people to root into one of the congregations for their community. So people, who, because one of the problems you, why don't you say, remember we started to realize something? Well, one of the problems was, of course, if you say, you know, options in a world of options usually is a positive thing, but in the context when you're trying to build a, a community and, and have congregations rooting, um, if they're not doing that, we found that people slipped off our radar because if someone didn't show up to Brentwood, I'd think, oh, well, they're over at Allison or they went to Saturday night and Dave would be thinking the same thing. Yep. And the next thing you know, um, people would maybe fall off our radar, maybe even disappear unnoticed. So we really felt the value of saying, listen, you need to choose a congregation and get yourself rooted in there so that you can create, you can have community because you, you can't, you can, you can hide, you see, you could hide in this structure. Um, and we didn't want people to, yeah. to either fall away or to feel like, well, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm mad at somebody in this congregation, so I'm going over there. Yeah, which happened. Um, but let me, again, about this new day, though, the, uh, and we're, talk, we, we're trying to be honest about the, the adjustments, the struggles, the learns, and everything. Um, one of the things, though, we also uh, um, forced us to do with this model, which actually, it's one of the reasons why, regardless of all the, the pain and transitions we went with it, I am absolutely convinced I still would have gone down this road, everything I know now, is it forced us to take equipping the Ephesians 4 equipping to a whole new level. I think, I, because here, he, I, I, I just want to be, let me just, oh, bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> let me just be blunt, try to be blunt about something without again being obnoxious about it. You know, when you have one service and, and you only need to have, you know, that one worship leader, and you only need to have that one excellent group of ushers. I mean, I'm just, I'll try to use terminology that is more adaptable to most of our churches. And you have that one organist or that one choir leader or that one, and everybody's going, no, that's really good. But the problem is this. What if you have one great choir leader for that one service who's managing it, everything, but there's actually two potential new choir leaders down in the congregation? When will they ever get a turn? When will they ever be tested and stretched? One service, it doesn't open doors for equipping. It allows us to, be, to lean more to a star approach 
Let's get the best up on the stage to give leadership in that weekend worship experience and let's see what happens. And, and what bothered me was I realized, well, what intrigued me and what pulled me towards the multi-site model is all of a sudden I had to say to all of our leadership, um, you can't clone yourself. You have to equip and reproduce yourself. And all of a sudden, we've got to raise up more worship leaders. We've got to raise up more hospitality teams. That's our new word for ushers. We've got to raise up, well, and, and let, me just be, let me just be dramatic to make a point here. So as Carolyn was on our staff part-time for a few hours a week and as she was initially sorting out her call, she, she did play that role of being sort of the, the front host, you know. Hi, everybody. And you can see her energy. She's kind. She's a lot warmer than me. And, you know, the whole nine yards, right? Welcome. Da, da, da. And, and the problem is, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to make a point here, and you can say, well, Dave, you're kind of pushing it, but that's what I'll do just to make the argument. But... If we had gone down the road of just building a bigger church, well, I still would have been the main preacher. We still would have had John or someone being the main music guy. And what do you think Carolyn still would have been doing? Because there's no room. There's no room. This is one big service, and we gotta, you know, we gotta have you in your best spot. But the moment we went to this, all of a sudden I can remember going to Carolyn and saying, Carolyn. I don't want you to be a host anymore. And I don't want you to just be doing this like outreach and communications, which has been good and you had all these other experiences. But Carolyn, I think all these experiences you've been having for the last 15 years at our church, guess what, Carolyn? I think God wants you to be a campus pastor. And she goes, but I'm not even ordained. I go, we're going to take care of that. <laughs> and, and, I, and she goes, but no one's going to respect me. No one's going to, like, they're, they're going to talk behind my back. I go, get used to it. <laughs> and, and I... I, I said, yeah, but Carol, I said, I think this is what God wants you to do. And Carol goes, I think this is what God wants me to do too, but I'm so scared, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and you know what? Because of the multi-site model, we force those type of conversations. Now, I'm not, I know there's other ways to challenge people into their call and development, but I want to say this very practically. We have to, every week, produce three worship services. That's 156 worship services a year. Every week, free services. That means every week there's got to be teams, people, children's ministry people, media people. There's got to be people ready to go and be part of it. And you know what? It forces us to invite people into deeper levels of service. Whereas if I just had one service, I'd go, <laughs> you're not going to get asked. Now I'm going, no, I got to ask you. Which means they aren't going to be as professional. It means we have to be more intentional about training. It means we have to be more intentional about equipping or we're not going to make this multi-site model work. But it gets more people engaged and invited to be part of God's work and ministry in new significant ways. Okay. Carolyn, over to you. Chapter 6. Two chapters to go. Chapter 6. The Call. I hope you're all still with us online. Um, the call. On October 5th, 2008, I had what Dave calls my first ordination service. On October 5th, 2008, I was brought forward. Um, the congregation came forward. It was our first service at the Brentwood campus. They laid hands on me, they prayed for me, and at that moment, I was set apart as their campus pastor, and the journey began. And I just want to share with you, over you know, these past six, six years, six plus years, um, what I have learned as I've pastored in this context in particular, um, over the years of this you know, multi-site model. The first thing I've learned is that idolatry idolatry comes in many forms. 
I want to tell you a quick story. I want to tell you a story about a person who was a member of the original Brentwood United Baptist Church. And he was in charge of, you know, looking after as we were making the renovations in this building and we were sort of taking down some of the uh, old symbols and, and, and uh, pieces of, of, you know, symbolism that mattered to that church at that time. We were sort of removing things and... And he was in charge of that. So he would have former members call him and say, people who had left the church, I want to have this certain you know, uh, piece that is now not going to be used. I want to, and, and, and they, he would facilitate having people come in and gather all of these things that we knew we weren't going to carry along with us in this new day. And there was this one day when I was in there with him and we were kind of going through some things and then one of the former members showed up and he just had a feverish look on his face. He was just like, give me this stuff. And he had a box and he just quickly gathered up these things that he thought now were, he was rescuing from a terrible fate. And I remember this gentleman said to me, as he witnessed this and as the, as the fellow went out the door with this box of, of goodies that he had rescued, from this terrible new reality. He just looked at me with tears in his eyes. This is an older gentleman who was one of actually, on the, you know, he was one of the founding people of this congregation. And he just said, we have made these things, these relics, these things more important than the people in our neighborhood who are without Christ. And he was in tears over this. It was a moment where he was convicted in a really deep way. What were we doing? Why were these things more important to us? And this was a real transformational moment. And to, do, to this day, I mean, this gentleman has been one of our biggest, one of my biggest supporters. You know, he's my go-to person. You know, when, when I want something done or I, I need his influence for, you know, to get something done. And it was so, it, well, it was a life change moment and I witnessed this. I could see this, the scales come from his eyes. He was seeing something new. He was now seeing a whole new opportunity for reaching this community. That was what we were going to value. That's moving forward what our mission was. But the other thing that I want to share with you is in this model, I also experienced tremendous complexity. Complexity. You see, as the campus pastor, my call was to be the carrier of the DNA of the Journey Church. I became the one that would help, you know, the new people, the, the older congregation, and even those who pioneered that came with me to establish this new day. I had to help them. Um, to implement this and I was the carrier and the DNA that made us missional needed to be ongoing and as the leader I needed to make sure that that environment was created and ongoing along with others. But it was part of my key role as the Brentwood campus pastor. So picture this. I now have three groups of people, three of them, that I now have to approach in three different and very complex ways. Now imagine that. Okay, so, so the first group of people I had to, you know, work with and, and, and had to, to uh, just kind of, you know, the words that I had to speak to them were words that you would think are oxymorons, but that change is okay. So with the original congregation who stayed and who, who took that step of faith and who took that courageous step, I had to say to them, change is okay. And not only is it okay, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. God is going to bless you for, for giving what you have given up and giving over to him in his name. And in fact, that courageous risk they took would be a blessing to them. And you know, I took every opportunity I could to show them. This was my job. You know, we'd be in the middle of the service and I would take some key people down. I'd say, come on downstairs. And a nursery that was, had no children was full. The lower level was crawling with children. 
There was mess and madness going on. In fact, we'd be in the middle of a service, wouldn't we, Dave? And you could hear the thump, thump, thump of the subwoofer down, down below with the new sound system. And you know, you'd be tempted as a person of, you know, you'd be saying, well, this is distracting, I can't, you know. But instead I had to say, isn't this exciting? We can't hear ourselves think up here because there's children in the lower level. This is, this is amazing, eh? So I had to continually show them. And I also had to be a translator for them because we all know, as someone had said earlier in one of the sessions, words create worlds, right? So we had to create, we had to create a new language. I had to be a translator for them. And instead of a, you know, and this would seep in sometimes, an us versus them, well, I don't know what they are thinking or I don't know what they are going to do. No, we had to go from us versus them to we. We had to become we. And I had to be corrective all the time because I had to create a, a brand new language for them moving forward. So I became their translator. And then I had those who were new. So we had new people coming, people who were coming from the neighborhood. And so for those new people, I had to say, this is a place you can belong. This is a place that you can connect. You can connect to Christ here and you can connect to his people. And so that's, you know, I had this dynamic of new people and walking them through um, this, this new mix. And of course, they didn't have any history. So we had to make sure we created a, a culture and an atmosphere that saw newcomers as gifts from God. And how do we treat a gift? We really had to work on the hospitality team so that they would warmly welcome those who came because we knew the first seven minutes mattered, you know, for newcomers. So, so for a newcomer, they needed to know that they could belong here. This was a safe place for them. And then I had the courageous folks who pioneered with me who came from Allison. And the words that I would describe them, for them, and they were about 40 in number when they made that pioneering, they made a pioneering sacrifice. And I would, I would like to say, yeah, that is the word that they also, you know, for them was a pioneering sacrifice. Because what they had to do was say, okay, we'll give up our congregation that we're happy with and that our kids all know the layout of the land and we'll come with you to help to try to establish that, that same sort of outreaching missional culture but we're gonna to have to give some things up. And I can remember there was one woman who actually lived in the Brentwood neighborhood who had been coming to Allison. She came to faith there, she was baptized there. So she had a real heart connection to the Allison campus. And she said, but this church is in my neighborhood. And she admitted to me, Dave. She said, and I really liked Dave. And I said, so it was a real sacrifice coming to where a red-headed campus pastor was. I'm not Dave. But she saw, she saw the opportunity. She saw something bigger than herself. And the third thing that I learned was that pastoring means building and battling at the same time. Ooh, the story of Nehemiah. I think we preached a series on that, didn't we, Dave, through all of this? Building and battling at the same time. And that's a great phrase for us because that was the tension we were in. You know, because especially at the Brantwood campus, we would have these times of success. You know, a new family came and they said they were just from down the street. And we'd be like, yes! But then there would be a crisis that comes up. And you know, the winds of crisis when you're one church, you're not immune to that we would feel the effects of that crisis over at our campus as well. So we would have these you know, losses and gains and we had to build and we had to battle. We'd see someone come to Christ, but then we'd have a church-wide conflict and I'd go, oh, we just got some momentum going, you know? But we've got to keep going. And while we had the strength of being part of a wider church, because we did, I mean, it was, you know, it was a strength to be part of the wider church with all of its structures and supports that we benefited from, but it also meant that we would also experience troubles that happened church-wide, and we would experience the results of those struggles. But not only were there, you know, external build and battle struggles, let me tell you, I had internal 
building and battling struggles. Because inside of me, I was thinking to myself, I can't do this, what am I doing? This is the craziest thing on earth. All the insecurities welled up in me. You know, when I was taking courses at Acadia, on top of trying to fulfill my week-to-week -week duties in a half-time capacity, I was wrestling with my own identity and insecurities. So I was building and battling internally too, and oh wow, there are no conclusions here except to say that building and battling are part of the journey because I don't believe it ends. And I think the temptation is to stop building if you're in the middle of a battle. I think that's the temptation. But the, the thing is, in, in ministry, and when you're dealing with people, and we're all imperfect, there's always going to be a battle. And when you're dealing with an enemy who wants to seek and kill and destroy, do you stop building? And the world around us, you know, you know, we're always going to be battling. And so the question is, do we stop building in the middle of a battle? And we externally and me internally had to continue in that tension of, no, we must press on. We're going to build as we battle. And so that leaves us to... We're just at chapter seven, but just before, is there any other questions? Yeah, Danny has one that uh, it's come through the live chat from the stream. Okay. This is from Frank Campbell, so I'll just paraphrase what he's asking. It's regarding those 200 that left. So if they were, were they really buying into that missional mindset that was at the previous church or, and if so, uh, why, why couldn't they buy into this new missional model? or perhaps move to the church? Why weren't they, why were they part of the 40 that moved? What exactly was going on there? Good question. Um, appreciate that. Um, you know, I, th this is probably for me the part where if I was doing a leadership class with the next generation of pastors or church leaders, I would say, you know, you, know, you learn a lot through your mistakes. And um, one of the things that happened was, I, 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 would, I would say this, uh, one thing I've learned is that we did too much change too quickly. And my capacity to handle change, I, um, I did not, I, I assumed too much, I projected my capacity onto other people too much in the congregation. And I realized that it, it moved them from a place of movement with me as, uh, along with the other leadership to a place of being very troubled as a congregation, which just recently we've done a survey and it reveals that a part, portion of our congregation is still troubled from all of that change. And, and again, this is just good change theory and I didn't pay attention enough to the dynamics of change. Um, I... I also want to say though, and it kind of ties back actually to something that Dr. McMullen talked about this morning, is that I will say this, that when, I, I am convinced that when you're trying to do something missional and something, you know, risky and creative, I also think that you're wide open for, um, I think, satanic opposition. Um, and I cannot tell you we ran head smack into, on the, in fact, on the very weekend that we were um, dealing with uh, the Brentwood Church coming to our congregation and seeing our congregation vote for this because they had just voted for it literally two days before. So we were trying to do something symbolic with the leadership coming in. They sat up in the front row and they did not know this, but we had hit a massive financial crisis in our church and um, we hit a major staffing crisis in our church and uh, a major staff person was being let go on that day on the vote. I do not want to tell you how much pain that was that day. It was insanity. Now what's kind of funny is that, um, and I mean funny only in a really sad, morbid way, um, was we did have some of the leadership from the Brentwood Church say, you know, I don't feel so bad about us now. <laughs> Um, when they saw that we were messed up and broken in, in, in other ways in our organization that, um, but it all came to a head literally on the same day of the vote. I could not, you could not have had worse timing. 
I will also say that we, um, what, what created this, this loss of this, this large group of people was, um, it was, it was, we also did a governance change on the top of the multi-site change, on top of the name change, on, on top of the staffing disruption. Now, I just want you to try to absorb that. That was not just a perfect storm. That was crazy land. And when I say a governance change, it was a governance change where we went to a single board in the whole nine years. Now, it wasn't that we were surprising people with this. It's just that it was this, it was this, it was this, it was this. It was huge. And I, in a sense, I bet the whole farm all at once, you know, uh, to use that poor analogy. Um, and, and I also, though, want to say this. And, 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 and I still contend this. I think that, um, you know, we talk about what are the missional models out there for a church. We talk about the incarnational model. You know, we, we become the hands and feet of Jesus. We live out through our character in the presence and we're the salt uh, in, in the community. And I totally believe that. In fact, I'm, I'm more committed to that than ever. I don't, uh, but I'm not still opposed to an attractional ministry where I, I think do the best you can so people can come in and be engaged. But what happened was, I think we had weighted too much of ourselves in our growth at that point, and I felt like we were a teenage type church, that we had, um, we had weighted too much on the attractional side and not enough on the incarnational side. And I really wanted to move our church more incarnationally, which I felt the multi-site model actually was gonna make us do, which I say it has done. But we had a lot of people who were enjoying the show, to put it bluntly. And all of a sudden, when there was this change and change came conflict and conflict meant chaos I also realized that we had a lot of people who we had not discipled well enough to handle emotionally conflict because what do most people uh, let's, let's just have a moment of honesty among all our families the people who aren't mature and healthy in your family when there's conflict in your family what happens they do two things right they either fight or they flee or they'll fight and then they'll flee or they'll flee and then they'll come back and fight. <laughs> and you know what? If that happens inside our families, which I know it does, I've done enough pastoral counseling to know this happens, I just have to look at my own family. That guess what? It happens in a church family too. Now again, now throw a ton of craziness in the midst of I, And if I had to do that part all over again, I would have said, Let's slow down the change and let's parse it out a little bit more. The problem was, and I mean, I will say this, I've been working away at this for 18 months. 18 months in the midst of still dealing with all the pressures of our growth. I felt like we, if we're going to go, we got to go. And then, oh man, it was like coming off a cliff. And unfortunately, we, we lost some, it really became a pruning time. It also really was an, a time for us to assess where we were in our helping people become healthy in our church, emotionally and spiritually in their church. I, that's a long answer. I'm sorry, but I hope that helps. Okay? So let's, let's end up. Um, and, and we have, uh, we, we wanted to end at 8.30 and it's 22, but we're doing okay. We're doing okay, we're doing okay right? Okay. Um, is everybody okay? We're, we're good here? Okay. Um, I didn't wait. You notice I didn't wait for an answer. I just keep going. Um, so our last chapter title is this. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? You know, I, 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 Carol and I are both going to answer this and we're going to jump back and forth on a couple of answers here. But here's my first, my first, my, my first response. Why was it worth, it worth it? For me, when people ask me, Dave, you know, when you think about what's taken place the last six to nine years in this journey at the Journey Church and everything that's gone on, you know, what, 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 what warms your heart? And for me, it warms my heart um, to think that one of our Baptist churches, which was becoming again one of those familiar statistics in our Atlantic Baptist family, where it was declining, dwindling, and dying. Um, that, and I can remember going there a year before we made the shift, and like, there was like 18 people there and I mean, 18 people spread out among a congregation of, that could see, see 200 max. And, and, I, and I remember thinking, there's got to be, a, there's got to, there, this, there's, this church has lost its way. And is there a way for this church to become missional again? And, and I, I'm, I'm, I have total respect for the church planners that I know 
Peter Reed is trying to raise up in our, and we need to have new church plants. And I think there's something really courageous about new church plants. It's funny where I feel God has led me as a pastor. I have a real heart to see churches that once, and I think still are having strategic mission points throughout Atlantic Canada, be it in cities, towns, villages, or rural areas, that I think that, I think this default to say, well, let's consolidate and let's shut down buildings. I, I don't buy that as much as I hear it being talked about. Maybe we just should become a denomination of 200 churches instead of, you know, shut down half of our church. I don't, I don't buy that. I, I, I think that, that, I think that the fact that there's a, a, a vibrant Baptist missional church in West End Moncton now um, is a light in that community in a way that I can't have an impact from Salisbury Road in. And I think when, and when I go in now and I do see children downstairs and I see Blake with tears in his eyes, he goes, there's kids downstairs and there's new families coming in. I want to say that's redemptive. And I believe that there's, there's a group of churches out there that God is blessing right now. And I think rather than just going with the model, build bigger and we'll take care of our base and we'll keep our resources and we'll become more attractional and doing our ministries. And, and, it's, and all those statements are right. I also think part of their ministry vision has to be, but you know, there's a church seven minutes down the road, 10 minutes down the road, uh, 20 minutes down the road, a half hour down the road, that if we could just come in with an expulsive force of love and overwhelm them with some wind in their sails and gift them some of our best people, which ironically would equip those people to take it up to the next level. And who knows, some of those people may end up coming to Acadia to get studied so they become a full-time pastor and da-da-da-da-da. Well, guess what? I say let's start having that vision, that redemptive model of, of mission uh, for our churches in Atlanta, Canada. So that's one reason why it's worth it. Okay. I want to start preaching there, Carolyn. Preach it. Woo. Preach it. Well, it's exciting. It's exciting. Um, for me, was it worth it? Uh, the word that comes to mind for me is awakening. There has been an awakening happen in the congregation of that church. There's been an awakening in the neighborhood. Today, the parking lot is full. Today, um, if you were to come probably 10 minutes after 11 now, which is, you know, our culture, it's okay to come late, um, <laughs> you won't be able to find a parking spot. In fact, there are cars now parked up and down either side of two of the streets. And that is exciting because what happened um, as, as people started to come and as you know, the church started to grow over these years, there was a family whose kitchen window faced the church in the community. And the mother of this family would wash her dishes on Sunday morning and she'd look out and she'd see you know, four or five, maybe 10 cars in the parking lot and that would be a normal Sunday. Well, all of a sudden, she started to notice that the, car, the parking lot was full. And all of a sudden, she wondered, what on earth is going on over there? And so she and her husband came. And they showed up and they said, we just, we just live through, the, through the, the trees there. We can watch. We're seeing what's going on. And not only did they start coming, but then they brought their young adult son. And then I had the privilege two years ago to baptize him. And they became members of our church. It was an exciting thing. There was an awakening going on. And we can now say that there are upwards of 300 people now who are associated with the Brentwood campus at this time. And we would probably run a nice 150 to 170 every weekend. But we can say now that we see families walking up the street, coming to the church. It is the church in the community. The two K to eight schools that are in the community, we have been able to support their breakfast program through Thanksgiving offerings. We've invited the teachers in a couple of times now over the years to just have a teacher's appreciation luncheon. We've had a business who catered that luncheon who was a family from Lebanon and now the woman who owns that business on Milner Road is now coming to the church and she says to me, Carolyn, I can only understand about half what is said. 
but she comes because she feels the love she, her family experienced as, as we invited them to cater our teacher's luncheon and they asked, why are you doing this? Well, because we're called by Christ to love others. He calls us to love others. And that's what has happened with this congregation. We're no longer invisible. We are a church that is now engaged in the neighborhood, and I know that there are other exciting, new, wonderful chapters to be written, exciting new opportunities that are just around the corner in that neighborhood. It's exciting. Um, Carolyn, you don't, don't sit down. Um, Lois wanted to know about the rest of the story about the woman who parted your hair. I think this is the time to tell it. And six years ago, after that encounter, this woman had said to me, I am leaving this church and I'm not going to come back. And she would come because her spouse was involved in the leadership of the church and she just said, I'm just coming to support my husband and that's the only reason, but I'm, I'm giving you notice now. And so, one day we went out to lunch. I said, let's go and talk about this. Can we just talk? I want to hear what's been going on. And she just unleashed her, the pain of this. This was my church. This was my church. And, and now it's just all different. And I, I just don't know what to do with this. And we journeyed together over the years. And she eventually started to get involved in some ministries, but always like this. Now, don't think that I'm, I, I don't know that I'll ever call this my church. And I can tell you that today, she is fully engaged in ministry. And she supports and has supported me over these past years in so many ways. And so that's an exciting story because you could see God change your heart and it was through loving patience and allowing her to express her pain and saying, you know, I'm sorry that that's how it's gone for you. That's really hard when you talk about it that way. And I feel that for you. But is there a way you could be patient with us and work with us and allow God to use you in this new day? And he has. And she's such a blessing, such a blessing. The um, interesting thing is in that first part of the story, she remember Carolyn said that she and a friend of hers went out and wouldn't be part of the prayer circle way back. The neat part is her friend is now on our vision team. And uh, it's just, again, it's just one of those redemptive moments. Um, was it worth it? Um, my, here's my last statement. Um, I, again, I want to be honest with you that I, I've been at this one church. Uh, God has given me the grace and the strength and I consider it an absolute privilege. I've been, I've been there for 28 plus years. And I want to also say honestly though, the last six, the moment we stepped into this multi-site model, it's been that Charles Dixon moment, you know, it's been the worst of times and it's been the best of times. And I, and I, I don't say that lightly. Um, it's been the best six years in the worst six years of my pastoral ministry. It's been the most challenging. In the last six years, we've had painful staff disruptions. We've had crisis. We've had moral failure among some of our leadership people. And yet at the same time, we've seen people rise up, uh, discover their call, grow up. We, we've, we've started to ask deeper questions about not just are we an incarnational church, but are we a an emotionally healthy church? Are we, what does, what's our insides really like? What's the, our souls like? Are we really big soul people in, in our church? Um, you know, I'd be honest with you, I've learned more about facing conflict in my last six years than in my first 22. Um, I've learned more about, about process and systems. Um, you know, I really, I really could teach a class now, Steve. I, I think I could. Um, you know, and, and the thing is, we continue to see people come to Christ. Uh, you know, we've seen, we're, 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 we're being more intentional about passing on our faith to the next generations of children and youth. It's been hard, it's been good, 
um, I'll be honest, I, I, I've, you know, they, they talk about, right, hitting the wall in your, in your phases of faith, right? You, 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 you know, you come aware of God, you grow in your faith, you start serving, and then you hit the wall. And I've had to really look at my style, my leadership, why I was doing certain things. Um, all of this mission caused me to go deeper and really be honest, because I... I I got to ask myself, what kind of pastor am I becoming? You know, I, I know I'm, a, I'm the shepherd of souls, but how's Dave's soul? And so I've had a look at all that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I'm just saying that it, it has been a refining time. And I'm convinced that one of the blessings when you do God's work is it refines you and it helps you grow, draw closer to Christ. And uh, I say God bless for all that. I really don't believe I'm going to get the last word. <laughs> but it looks like I get the last word just for a second here. I want to end on this. You know, uh, I told you that my first Sunday at the Brentwood campus of the Journey Church was October 5th, 2008. And I remember that day. I'll never forget it. It was such an exciting time in the life of our church, but in my life, as I was, you know, being all of a sudden put into this place where God was working out a call in my life. And so we were driving down the road, and I had my son, Luke, in the back seat, and at that time, well, that was almost, he was 10 years old. And so he's sitting in the back seat, and he goes, because we weren't going to the Allison church, he goes, Mom, are we going to your church this Sunday? And I went, my church? Going to my church? And I said, Luke, no. We're not going to my church. We're going to Jesus' church. And that was the message that I had to preach on that very first Sunday, that this is not our church. This is Christ's church, the bride of Christ, whom he gave his life for, this is his church. He is the head and we're the body. And that was my first Sunday there. It's Christ's church. But I want to tell you about my last Sunday there, which was just at the end of January. And I preached my last sermon, which was part of a message series, and it just happened to be that it was going to be on grief and loss, and I was the living illustration, eh, Dave? I was, Carol, you're the living illustration here. Well, this is fun. <laughs> but I had the gift of, once I finished my message, of walking off the platform and jumping into the baptistry, and I baptized two senior adults who I had been journeying with over the past couple of years and who they came and they said, we want to publicly profess our faith in Christ. Can I just say I went out with a splash? <laughs> there was a splash zone. I'm just telling you right now. And that was a gift from God that I was able to end my chapter there in such a wonderful way. So you're asking, was it worth it? There were risks that were taken for both congregations, risks that were taken by the leadership team. I believe that by God's grace, it was worth it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Dave, very much. I've got a lot of things in my mind. Um, I know a number of you have asked questions already, but I'm going to give you a chance for a couple more questions if you would like to ask them. Those are the three congregations from the two campuses. So one church, Two campuses, three congregations. Mike. 
Yeah, I asked this question on Twitter, but I'm going to ask it in person since I'm just sitting right here next to the microphone. Um, I'm, it's not directly related to this, but I'm really curious about what your order of service looks like on a Sunday. What does a Sunday mm. service look like at the Journey Church? Mm. Um, well, well here, here's our, our order of service. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, we're, we're more casual slash contemporary, whatever those words really mean. Um, we usually just open with a, a, a very casual welcome, uh, whatnot. We have, uh, as you come in, we have uh, always a coffee table and everything replenished up nicely so you can have coffee and tea and, and, and everything. We invite you to take it right into the worship service. We welcome you. We move into a journey of worship. Um, sorry for the pun, but we go through that. We have, and that's usually 15 to 20 minutes, right, Carolyn? Yes. And, yeah. uh, and then we move usually out of that. And, this is, and I, we do mix it up. I'm giving you the basic template. Uh, after that journey of worship, uh, which usually is tied to the theme that we're focused on for that day, we then uh, 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 we invite, and the children from ages three up to grade five have been part with their families in that worship because we believe we want the families to worship together. And then we have a, what we have a connection time, and we actually can that can range from seven to ten minutes. We're actually we'd say, okay, we're going to connect now, so the children can now leave for their program, uh, for their teaching program, and the rest of you you can replenish your coffees. But we really want you to take time to have some conversations because we found people. The new people come late and leave early, and, and we wanted to create that middle time in the worship to create that connection time. Following the connection time, we have our community and prayer and our giving. We move to the message, and because of the dynamics of our planning, usually we don't have a closing song. We just have a, uh, everyone stand for the benediction, and we leave because we're moving on to the next service. Would you stand with me as we pray to close? Heavenly Father, we thank you for times to be challenged, times to encourage one another, times to be reminded of who you are, to, remind, to be reminded that the church is your church and that you've called us, that you are with us, that you equip us and that you bless us. Father, may we, by your grace, see new life in our churches. And may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.